Welcome to the Synthesis of Yoga series, the book that changed my life. We are on the eighth episode, the second chapter of the book, The Three Steps of Nature, ninth paragraph. So these three steps of nature, where Sri Aurobindo brings the perspective on what nature has already established in evolution and what is ongoing and what is potentially emerging. These are the three evolutionary steps. And that first step, what, is, what she has established is the bodily life with a durable, flexible, responsive body. Upon that foundation, the current stage of evolution is ongoing, which is the mental development. And in the last two paragraphs, Sri Aurobindo described that the mental development is not for the first time happening in humanity. As he described, nature goes through her cyclic process where she rushes forward in one region of earth with one group of humanity, pushing the limits and then withdraws her impulsion from that group and moves on to another group another civilizational team and pushes them forward, whereas the previous one falls back, the awakening impulse falls back. So the savage is an intermediate sleep. What appears to be people, a group without much intellectual development is an intermediate sleep. There were previous cycles in which these capacities were developed and there was a recoil and fall back. And uh, so there were many cycles in the past. And the current protagonist or the movement in the last 300 years began from Europe and started spreading across the world. That's where we are. And this mental development is the ongoing step. And with that mental development comes the imbalance and the need for bringing the right balance or that we have touched upon in the previous paragraphs. Let's now take on with the ninth paragraph. Moreover, the whole trend of modern thought and modern endeavor reveals itself to the observant eye as a large conscious effort of nature in man. This is the picture he brings again and again, repeatedly. It is the effort of nature in man through man. The, a large conscious effort of nature in man to effect a general level of intellectual equipment. To effect a general level of intellectual equipment, capacity and further possibility by universalizing the opportunities which modern civilization affords for the mental life. So a universal education today is a globally set ideal and goal. Literacy across the planet. It's no more a privilege of small group. It's part of the human rights to have literacy, intellectual development, intellectual capacity. It's part of our global civilization's ideal. Humanity as a whole, there is a universalization happening of this intellectual ability, potentiality, and it can be rapidly developed, as Sri Aurobindo mentioned in the previous chapters, previous paragraphs. Even within few generations, when there is the right condition, the latent potentialities can rapidly emerge because there had been many previous cycles of human civilization and those capacities are there, latent, ready to bloom in the right condition. The whole trend of modern thought and modern endeavor reveals itself to the observant eye as a large conscious effort of nature in man. So what appears to us as the effort of various nations or, or various global 
organizations like UNESCO or United Nations. It is actually a large conscious effort of nature in man to effect a general level of intellectual equipment, capacity and further possibility by universalizing opportunities which modern civilization affords for the mental life. So, we can see this now spreading rapidly across the world, lifting up all humanity towards a general higher level of intellectual capacity. Even the preoccupation of the European intellect, the protagonist of this tendency, remember, Sri Aurobindo is writing this a hundred years ago, 1914. At that time, it was Europe that was the protagonist leading that tendency. Today's world is quite different. Europe has now in the back seat. Other nations have come into the front seat. Even the preoccupation of the European intellect, the protagonist of this tendency with material nature and the externalities of existence is a necessary part of the effort. Now he is bringing in a new perspective. There was a preoccupation, there still is. The, the protagonist of this tendency with preoccupation of the European intellect, the protagonist of this tendency with material nature and the externalities of existence is a necessary part of this effort. Which effort? Nature's effort to universalize. In that, even the preoccupation with the externalities of material nature is part of the process. And there is a very interesting insight coming here. It seeks to prepare a sufficient basis in man's physical being and vital energies, physical being and vital energies, and in his material environment for his full mental possibilities. So there is a preparation going on, preparing the physical ground of our physical being and the vital energies and his material environment for his full mental possibilities. By the spread of education, by the advance of the backward races, by the elevation of the depressed classes, by the multiplication of labor-saving appliances, by the movement towards ideal social and economic conditions, by the labor of science towards an improved health, longevity and sound physique in civilized humanity. The sense and drift of this vast movement translates itself in easily intelligible science. So we can see that science and technology is pioneering that effort of spreading this development across the planet, raising up the backward races and elevation of the depressed classes, multiplication of the labor-saving appliances, movement towards ideal social and economic conditions. So we can see various philosophers and economists all looking at an ideal society, how do we move towards perfecting a society where there is equality and abundance for all? This dream had been rekindled again and again and again and again, and it is a living intensity in the world today. The exploitation of one class by another, one nation by another, is no more acceptable. There is a globalized civilization emerging. So by the spread of education, by the advance of the backward races, by the elevation of the depressed classes, by the multiplication of the labor-saving appliances, by the movement towards ideal social and economic conditions, by the labor of science towards an improved health, longevity and sound physique in civilized humanity, 
The sense and drift of this vast movement translate itself in easily intelligible terms in science. So the vast impulsion of nature is pushing humanity to spread the intellectual capacity across humanity. And when we see huge inequalities of economic wealth, we see that is not an acceptable condition. It is no more a value. We openly, publicly see that this is an imbalance. There should be the opportunity, equal opportunity for everyone. And access for education, material opportunities, educational opportunities, healthcare facilities, and longevity, all these are now seen as basic requirements and ideals set forward. Doesn't mean we have achieved it. There are huge imbalances, but that imbalance is also perceived not as acceptable. This is non-acceptable. Things are to spread and globalize and universalize. And this impulsion, even though it is acting through global agencies and nation states, this vaster impulsion is coming from nature. Nature is pushing that current ongoing stage of evolution of mind to be wide spread a larger position of humanity. And we can see with the help of modern technologies, education will only accelerate, the spread of education will only accelerate, high quality education will only accelerate, and longevity will be more and more established. And what is yet to be seen is how the economic equality and opportunities will emerge in the emerging new world that is unfolding in front of us. But nature's intention is very clear. The sense and drift of this vast movement translates itself in easily intelligible science. The right, or at least the ultimate means, may not have always employed. So in this attempt, various nation states and groups of humanity may not have applied the right method and right way of doing it. Each group translates the impulsion of nature in their own ways. The right or at least the ultimate means may not have always employed, but their aim is the right preliminary aim. There is the right aim set. A sound individual and social body and the satisfaction of the legitimate needs and demands of the material mind. Sufficient ease, leisure, equal opportunity so that the whole of mankind and no longer only the favored race, class or individual may be free to develop the emotional and intellectual being to its full capacity. So art, literature, poetry, music, these are no more limited to a privileged race or a class or a few individuals. We can see that democratization happening rapidly across the world. When I say democratization, I don't mean political voting system. I mean access to everyone. Opportunity, equal opportunity for everyone. If you take, say for example, filmmaking, it's a complex technological adventure. Today with a mobile phone, anyone can make and mobile phone has become a common thing in the hands of the masses. Very powerful computer in the hands of the people. And that also become the means of their education, rapid mental development. And this is emerging as actually because of a nature's impulsion working through individuals, nation states, and transnational global organizations. And that intent is very clear. And more and more people are able to enter into creative adventure in the global civilized our emerging society. 
the global village in which each individual can become a creator and tools are accessible to everyone. You're only limited by your creative capacity, your creative imagination, your intellectual ability and your learning opportunities. Now with online education, abundance of knowledge, this is spreading globally the intellectual culture and rapid growth of a global civilization. The right or at least the ultimate means may not have always employed. This is to be understood. Not every group, every nation state may have applied the right means, but the, their aim is the right preliminary aim. What is that aim? A sound individual and social body and the satisfaction of the legitimate needs and demands of the material mind. Sufficient ease, leisure and equal opportunity. So there should be sufficient leisure if individuals are to slog it out the whole day to survive. That's not acceptable condition for intellectual culture to emerge. So it will be natural in the coming years to see that more and more people will be able to have sufficient leisure time to grow multiple facets of their being, their intellectual and aesthetic being, emotional being, all that can develop. And civilizationally, collectively, we are moving towards it with enabling technological means and enabling aims and mindsets and policies. So that the whole of mankind and no longer only the favored race, class or individual may be free to develop emotional and intellectual being to its full capacity. So we can see this exploding in front of us with modern technologies. But along with that growth, we also see rapidly growing imbalance because the old sound balance of the animal life, when it is confronting rapid growth of mental development, with it comes the stress, the anxiety, the challenges of growing mental life. And all the individuals are bombarded with mental input, an intense explosion of knowledge across the world, an inability to digest all that leads to imbalances. So we need also correspondingly a rapid deployment of education that brings the balance of the vital physical ground, the living body, the healthy body, fit body, and healthy emotional being upon which the intellectual culture and aesthetic culture can emerge globally. At present, the material and economic aim may predominate. That's still the case. Economic and material aim is still the dominant call of the masses and mass media and mass industries. All that are still talking primarily about economic aim and material aim of life, the vital man, the animal man and animal instincts and impulsions, satisfying these impulsions, the whole consumerist culture that is eating up the planet is part of that. And we see how destructive it is when these impulses are stimulated and um, People across the world, nations across the world are waking up to this reality and finding ways to balance it, contain it, so that sustainable developments on this planet will be possible. So this has become acute needs and crisis. We are in pressure to rapidly evolve, change our animal nature so that our godlike technology can be used for the right purpose. So at present, material and economic aim may predominate. Again, remember, he wrote this in 100 years ago. Case is still the same. Economic and material mean aims are still the dominant ones, but always behind their works or their awaits in reserve, the higher and major impulse. So behind this is the vaster impulsion of nature. Beyond the material aim, 
beyond the economic aim, there is something deeper calling. So therefore we can see in the nations and groupings of humanity where material and economic development reached its fullness, its saturation, people are seeking things that are far more meaningful, deeper, a spiritual yearning awakens with its great intensity. And more and more people are seeking spiritual growth, a spiritual awakening. The need and the thirst for spiritual growth is spreading across the planet. So on one hand, there is rapid growth of materialism, which is providing the material ground and economic growth and material opulence to people. We are yet to figure out how that development can be brought in sustainably. Even this may be the predominant aim at present. Behind it, there is the greater aim being prepared behind the cover. The spiritual aim of humanity is slowly and steadily making its emergence. And people who are on the frontiers of thought and perception are seeing it, sensing it, opening to it, and walking into that path. And they will be the pioneers opening the doors of the next future. So at present, the material and economic aim may predominate, but always behind their works or their weights in reserve, the higher and major impulse. It's not our human impulse. Our human impulses are coming from a vaster undercurrents of nature's great power working through us. We are her thinkers through which she is attempting a greater goal. It is her own evolutionary leap into the future. We are the means through which she is working it out. And when the preliminary conditions are satisfied, our basics are taken care. Material life is taken care. When the preliminary conditions are satisfied, when the great endeavor has found its base, this bodily life become healthy and stable and durable and flexible. What will be the nature of that further possibility which the activities of intellectual life must serve? Just like the bodily life, a healthy bodily life, stable, durable, pliable, that is serving an emerging intellectual culture and life. And that mental development, intellectual development leads, guides the bodily life. The same way, once this intellectual and vital physical all get stabilized, so mental, vital, physical layers all get stabilized and sound and stable and capable of further enlargement. What will be the nature of that further possibility which the activities of the intellectual life must serve? Now he is bringing into the next level. If this is established, if this ongoing evolution of the mind in humanity, when it is well established in a sound, healthy, durable body, what will be the next? If mind is indeed nature's highest term, then the entire development of the rational and imaginative intellect and the harmonious satisfaction of the emotions and sensibilities must be to themselves sufficient. So here is the clue. If the mind indeed is nature's highest term, in our current evolution, the mind is the highest developed term and its rational intelligence is the highest term. If mind is indeed nature's highest term, then the entire development of rational and imaginative intellect and harmonious satisfaction of the emotions and sensibilities must be themselves sufficient. As a goal for the civilization, global civilization to evolve and grow, conceiving a refined intellectual culture, an aesthetic culture with flourishing of arts, music, poetry will be an end in itself. 
we don't have to conceive anything beyond. But if, on the contrary, man is more than a reasoning and emotional animal, if beyond that which is being evolved, there is something that has to be evolved, This intellectual and emotional animal is the ongoing evolution. Beyond that which is being evolved, if there is something that has to be evolved, if there is something beyond this to be evolved, then it may well be that fullness of the mental life, the suppleness, flexibility and wide capacity of the intellect, the suppleness, flexibility and wide capacity of the intellect. Suppleness is the ability of the intellect to open to new ideas and integrate it. Flexibility of the intellect is ability to flex itself without breaking and disintegrating and integrate everything new into it so that it can continuously expand and grow. So suppleness and flexibility and wide capacity of the intellect, the ordered richness of emotion and sensibility. So our heart and its emotions, when it is ordered and made rich and fine sensibility are developed, may be only a passage towards the development of a higher life and a more powerful faculties. This development of the intellectual culture, aesthetic culture, refinement of our intellect and its flexibility, its capacities and its wideness, emotional experience and its richness and sensibility. This may be a passage towards the development of a higher life and of more powerful faculties which are yet to manifest and to take possession of the lower instrument. So here he is pointing at that which is beyond these possibilities. These are yet to develop, yet to manifest and take possession of the lower instrument. Here mind itself is now seen as a lower instrument. Just as mind itself has so taken possession of the body that the physical being no longer lives only for its own satisfaction, but provides the foundation and the materials for a superior activity. So these three layers. So the bodily life has been taken possession by the mind and it provides the ground upon which the higher activity of the mind has been developing. Similarly, a higher faculty and possibility can come in and take possession of the mental instrumentation and the physical and vital instrumentation and put to a superior activity. And that is the possibility in us, in human nature. That's our evolutionary future. So there is an ongoing evolution of the mind and it is spreading and becoming universal, global, and it will become more and more accessible and available to the masses. Humanity will be raising up to that possibility. But that is only a preparation for something higher to come in and take possession of these lower instruments. This is what is ahead of us, an evolutionary adventure. And nature is preparing that. And mind is only an intermediate stage. The assertion of a higher than mental life is the whole foundation of Indian philosophy. In India, it has been a common knowledge that there is, there are higher faculties beyond the human mind and its intellectual capacity. And that's the whole foundation, the whole core of yogic knowledge, yogic processes. It is to develop that. The assertion of a higher than mental life is the whole foundation of Indian philosophy.
and its acquisition and organization is the veritable object. So the yogic methods are designed for the acquisition and organization of this possibility beyond mind. That's what is served by the methods of yoga. Let me read it again. The assertion of a higher than mental life is the whole foundation of Indian philosophy and its acquisition and organization is the veritable object served by the methods of yoga. So all the methods, all the schools of yoga essentially serve this purpose of going beyond the mental life. And this has been best, well established and well documented, well studied, well researched. There is a vast body of knowledge available in India about this possibility. And that's what all the schools represent, but different facets of this possibility. Mind is not the last term of evolution, not the ultimate aim. Mind is not the last term of evolution, not the ultimate aim, but like body, an instrument. Mind too is an instrument. We see how difficult it is to even look at the body as an instrument. We are so identified with the body. Now, we have to also look at the mind and its rational intelligence as an instrument. Now, fortunately, with the development of the artificial intelligence, we are able to look at intelligence as a tool. We can clearly see that it is a tool. Even if it appears to be smarter than us, it is still a tool. Mind is not the last term of evolution, nor an ultimate aim but like body, an instrument. Mind and its rational in intelligence is an instrument. Even its aesthetic capacities, its creativity, all these are part of instrumentation. It is even so termed in the language of yoga, the inner instrument, andhakarana. Just like the classification of the outer instrument as Thula Sharira, which is composed of Annamaya Kosha and Pranamaya Kosha. It is called Thula Sharira, the gross body. The inner is referred to as the Sukshma Sharira, the inner instrument. It is even so termed in the, in the language of yoga, the inner instrument. An Indian tradition asserts that this which is to be manifested is not a new term in human experience. That which is beyond mind, that which is to be manifested is not a new term in human experience, but has been developed before and has even governed humanity in certain periods of its development. So here again, he is pointing at previous cycles of humanity where these higher faculties had manifested in humanity and governed certain periods of human history. But it is not part of our known history. We do not yet know what was, say for example, Indus Valley civilization and Egyptian civilization or what was beyond that. What were the previous cycles of civilization? What was the culture? What was the faculty of consciousness they were relying upon? How did they create what they created? We do not yet know. We are in an intellectual stage of development. What type of faculty of consciousness did they possess? We do not have a very clear answer. And Indian tradition asserts that this which is to be manifested is not a new term in human experience, but has been developed before. 
and has even governed humanity in certain periods of its development. In any case, in order to be known, it must at one time have been partly developed. So he is repeatedly pointing at the possibility that this higher faculty that we are talking, the divine possibilities in us, must have been partly developed in the past. Otherwise, we wouldn't have known about it. And if then nature has sunk back from her achievement, he's again going back to that idea of nature reaching out to a high peak and sinking back. And if since then nature has sunk back from her achievement, the reason must always be found in some unrealized harmony. So there must be some reason why nature withdrew and sunk back from that higher achievement. The reason must always be found in some unrealized harmony some insufficiency of the intellectual and material basis. So in the past developments from where the nature has recoiled and sunk back, there must be some deficiency in the intellectual or the material basis to which she has now returned. Some over-specialization of the higher to the detriment of the lower existence. So it's quite possible that in the previous cycles, she rapidly reached out to an over-specialization of a higher faculty at the detriment of the lower faculty. Now she has returned to it. And we can see that nature and the whole development of materialism is for a reason. Science building up the ground from bottom up investigating all the way to the subatomic particles and the deep energy field below and how things are building up as atoms and molecules and cells and life forms and complex ecosystems. That whole knowledge has to be built up from ground up. And the previous cycles where some specialized effort was attempted and touched upon those higher faculties, she withdrew from this because there was insufficiency in the intellectual development or the material basis of the previous cycles. And that justifies why nature has taken this long route now, preparing the material ground. So if since then nature has sunk back from her achievement, the reason must always be found in some unrealized harmony. A higher level of synthesis and harmonization was missing. That's why she has withdrawn. Some insufficiency of the intellectual and material basis to which she has now returned. Intellectual and material basis to which she has now returned. And we can see that globally, there is intellectual and material development rapidly happening. To which she has now returned, some over-specialization of the higher to the detriment of the lower existence, which is in reference to her previous attempt. So this is also something that can happen. When you develop even the intellectual development, when it is excess, you may create imbalance in the other parts of your being. This can happen individually, it can happen collectively. Even as the highest development, as Sri Aurobindo mentioned in the very first chapter, when yoga focuses way too much on only the realization, only the liberation of the highest spiritual dimensions, it loses the grip on life on ground. So there was imbalances in the past accomplishments. Therefore, nature has withdrawn and sunk and now gone back to the material and intellectual ground to be prepared so that a greater synthesis, a sound, better, more rich synthesis is possible. A greater harmony is possible. 
But what then constitute this higher or highest existence to which our evolution is tending? So there is this broad pattern that he is bringing in. Three steps of nature. What is already established, what is going through its current evolution, what is in the process of emerging. So what constitutes this higher or highest existence? What is emerging, this higher, higher possibility to which our evolution is tending? In order to answer the question, we have to deal with a class of supreme experiences, a class of unusual conceptions, a class of supreme experiences, a class of unusual conceptions, which it is difficult to represent accurately in any other language than the ancient Sanskrit tongue, in which alone they have been to some extent systematized. Here comes the crucial importance of Sanskrit and original vocabulary. The original meanings are to be recovered. Even when in today's world, when we pick up Sanskrit vocabulary, we see that meaning is entirely lost. Take for example the word avatar. In today's world with the movies like avatar, where avatar, there is even a usage called avatar driver. Avatar is the body that you put on. But that is nothing to do with the ancient original conception of the word avatar. So we need to rediscover because in the ancient Sanskrit language that is where the original ancient experience of this highest accomplishments have been to certain extent systematized. Even the meaning of the word yajna when we translate into sacrifice it loses its essential meaning and we can see the ancient word smriti that gets translated as sati in Pali and later in the last century someone translated it as mindfulness. We lost profound richness of meaning in these two levels of translation. Smriti to sati to mindfulness we lost a deep, rich possibility. So there is a need to rediscover original vocabulary, original meanings of the words. In order to answer the question, what is that question? What constitute the higher or highest existence to which our evolution is tending? In order to answer the question, we have to deal with a class of supreme experiences, a class of unusual conceptions, which it is difficult to represent accurately in any other language than the ancient Sanskrit tongue, in which alone they have been to some extent, some extent systematized. That is the ancient documents, documented evidence and vocabulary that is available to us, which we need to decode. The only approximate terms in, English, in the English language have other associations and their use may lead to many and even serious inaccuracies. So the English language emerged in a different cultural context. And each word is like a vessel containing certain meaning and connected emotions. So the approximate terms of English language when we brought to associate with its original uh, ancient Sanskrit vocabulary may lead to serious inaccuracies. This is something we, need, we must be careful when we trace back the origins. The terminology of yoga recognizes besides the status of our physical and vital being, physical and vital being, these two layers, termed the gross body, the sthula sharira composed of the physical and vital being. So besides the status of our vital, physical and vital being termed the gross body and doubly composed 
of the food sheath and the vital vehicle. This gross body is doubly composed. We have touched upon it before multiple times. Food sheath and vital vehicle, annamaya kosha and pranamaya kosha. Besides the status of our mental being, termed subtle body, the sukshma sharira is the mental body. Besides the status of our mental being, termed the subtle body, the singly composed of the mind sheath, manomaya kosha, mind sheath, or mental vehicle, the vehicles with which we can travel in those corresponding worlds. That's a whole different body of knowledge of the yogic wisdom. There is called the vital vehicle. There is a vital plane and the traveling is possible. That's why it's a vehicle. Like in the material plane, we have the material body with which we can travel in the material plane. In the vital plane, there is a vital body. In the mental plane, there's a mental body with which we can move around. So there is food sheath, vital sheath, mental sheath, manomaya sharira, pranamaya sharira, annamaya sharira. A third supreme and divine status of supra mental being. Supra mental being. Infra is what is below the mind. Supra is what is above the mind. The being, the ranges of being beyond mind. Supreme and divine status of supra mental being, termed the causal body. This is ancient yogic vocabulary. Thula sharira, sukshma sharira, and karana sharira. Gross body, subtle body, causal body. A third supreme and divine status of supra mental being, termed the causal body and composed of a fourth and a fifth vehicle. This causal body is composed of, again, two, fourth and a fifth vehicle, which are described to those of knowledge and bliss. In English, or rather, not English. In English, it is knowledge, but then we lose the essential meaning. Vijnana maya kosha and ananda maya kosha. We see these vocabulary used in the Upanishads, the five sheets, Annamaya Kosha, Pranamaya Kosha, Manomaya Kosha, Vijnanamaya Kosha, Anandamaya Kosha. So this Vijnanamaya Kosha and Anandamaya Kosha constitute the causal body. That is the cause. And Sukshma Deha, Sukshma Sharira is the subtle body, the mental body. And Stula Sharira is composed of Pranamaya and Annamaya. These are all instruments, both mental and vital physical. They are all instruments. Karana Sharira and other is Karana Sharira. Cause and effect here. Composed of fourth and fifth vehicle, which are described as those of knowledge and bliss. So here he is giving this classification of the terminology of yoga. Stula Sharira, Sukshma Sharira and Karana Sharira. In English, we can say gross body, subtle body, causal body. This gross body has two layers, the physical and vital. And causal body also has two layers, Vijnanamaya, Anandamaya, knowledge and bliss. The terminology of yoga recognizes, besides the status of our physical and vital being, termed the gross body, and doubly composed of the food sheath and the vital vehicle. Besides the status of our mental being, termed the subtle body, and singly composed of the mind sheath or the mental vehicle, a third supreme and divine status of supra mental being, termed the causal body, and composed of a fourth and fifth vehicle, which are described as those of knowledge and bliss. But this knowledge is not a systematized result of mental questionings and reasonings. This knowledge, the knowledge of the causal body, we cannot access it through mental questionings and reasonings. This knowledge is not a systematized result of mental questioning and reasonings, not a temporary arrangement of conclusion and opinions. 
That's what the mental knowledge is all about. It is actually a temporary arrangement and conclusion and opinions in terms of the highest probability, but rather a pure self-existent, self-luminous truth. The knowledge of the causal body is to be known as self-existent truth, self-existent. They are not dependent on anything. Mind is creating impression about reality and that mental map is what we call our knowledge. And this is insufficient method to really know the causal ranges of our being, Vijnanamaya and Anandamaya ranges. And this bliss is not a supreme pleasure of the heart and sensations with the experience of pain and sorrow as its background. So the Vijnana, which is that knowledge of the causal, it is not systematized mental questioning or reasoning. The same way, the bliss is not a supreme pleasure of the heart and senses with the experience of pain and sorrow as its background. Our sensory experience and our heart's experience of emotions and fine sensations and all that always have pain and sorrow as its background. But this bliss what is referred is a delight also self-existent and independent of objects. It is independent of objects. It is self-existent. And particular experiences, a self-delight which is the very nature and the very stuff as it were of a transcendent and infinite existence. So it is not dependent on any particular experience, any particular object. It is self-existent. It is the very stuff of our transcendent ex existence, infinite transcendent existence. We have to transcend our bound, limited existence. Then only we can know that bliss as a self-existent bliss, just like that knowledge is also self-existent knowledge, not arrived at by reasoning and questionings. So that is the very nature of this higher existence. And so we are coming to now the end of this episode. And we have touched upon that higher existence and its possibilities. And even to know it, we need to go beyond this intellectual groping. It is beyond intellect itself. And it is yet to manifest, though in the past civilizational cycles, there were these experiences, but nature returned to this preparing the ground again, the material and intellectual basis for a higher level of perfection and harmony. There's a reason why this development is unfolding the, on earth with this materialized civilization. There's a reason for it, for a grand symphony. So with that, let's end today's episode. Thank you for your time, your attention. Share your views, feedback, suggestions, and subscribe to the channel. See you next Wednesday. Thank you.